Thursday morning. It's BBC Radio Cumbria. Uh, with me in the studio this morning, Matthew Entwistle, author of a book all about an extraordinary man called Millican Dalton, who for many years lived in a cave uh, in the county. The book called Millican Dalton, A Search for Romance and Freedom. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the show. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Millican Dalton, about the man himself, as to where he came from, what were his roots? Well, Millican was born in 1867 in the mining village of Nenthead, just outside Alston. He lived something of a normal lifestyle uh, until the age of 14 when his uh, mother uprooted the family and they moved south to London in uh, search of a better future. Um, at the age of 36, Millican was working as an insurance clerk and decided that the mundane aspects of day-to-day -day life within his office were too much. He was not happy with it, and he decided to quit his job to seek romance and freedom. So I take it he wasn't married? He wasn't married, um, as far as I can gather. Um, he didn't have many girlfriends either, um, because of his rather strange lifestyle. Or he did have a few admirers. Was it a strange lifestyle, though? Because obviously he didn't f think it was a strange lifestyle. It was the, the lifestyle that he chose to leave, or lead. Yeah, so he was happy with his choice of lifestyle. To him, it wasn't strange. He was he was not concerned with other people's opinions. He just got on with his own life and pursued his own dreams. So he decided then at the age of 36, enough's enough, he downed his tools, he got up and he got out. Uh, where did he first go to? After quitting his job in the city of London, he moved into a tent in Billericay in Essex. Um, he had an acre of land and he grew his own fruit and vegetables there and set up uh, a business as a mountaineering guide. And at some point he, like, headed almost back to his roots, he headed back north again. Uh, when was that? Um, around the turn of the 19th century, uh, 1900. Um, he, yeah, he headed back up to his roots. The Lake District was, of course, a very important tourist destination for the Victorian tourists and um, he you know pursued his um, mountaineering guides his camping holidays and what have you so in a way really he was quite a smart guy he went he, even though he was following his dream and looking for this romance um, he also knew how to make a living then because he went to where the work was back to the Lake District? Yes, he, he had a, a bit of money that he inherited, so he wasn't short of a, a pound or two. Um, but, yeah, he was a very intelligent guy, well-educated, and, of course, um, knew where to, you know, to find the, find the trade. And he found this cave? Yeah, the cave on the eastern flanks of Castle Crag. He'd, he'd explored a couple of other caves, but this was a more suitable option. It was dry, large, um, it was split leveled, two rooms running water through the ceiling. Uh, he took his bracken in there for his bed, had an eider down quilt and a plaid to keep him warm. Extraordinary man as well because um, he was actually quite domesticated in his ways because even though he lived in the cave, he kind of didn't go without because he made his own clothes. He made his own clothes, his own lightweight camping equipment long before it was generally available. He baked his own bread on a griddle. Um, it was, yeah, it was actually ahead of his time. He was vegetarian, teetotal. Um, he liked he, his woodbine. He, he smoked like a, yeah, he smoked woodbines as though he was inhaling oxygen. Um, he, he didn't drink though, but he, he made up for that with a heavy consumption of very strong, sweet black coffee. <laughs> so if one doesn't kill you, the other one will, I'm yeah. quite sure. Was he, was he very much a loner, or could he socialise? Even though many people referred to him as the Borrowdale Hermit, he wasn't a hermit in the true sense of the word. He didn't lead a solitary existence as such. He was social active with friends and family, and even stray, uh, with stray visitors who stumbled across his cave. We were saying before, um, he didn't kind of record much about himself, but there's a lot recorded about him. There's quite a, f a few photographs, so um, th there is one that I've been looking at where he's kind of posing outside of one of the shops in Keswick, and he's posing as well. So, did he like the attention? He was definitely something of a self-publicist, there's no doubt about that. Um, he might not have... Um 
been showing off or anything like that, but he, he definitely liked the publicity. He appeared on uh, British Paramount news feature um, and numerous um, national newspapers. So, yeah, he, he definitely um, liked to put his name about. And when you've been talking to people about putting this book together, um, have you kind of uncovered things that have surprised you about this man? Um, well, because it was a natural progression, there's not, not too many shocking truths that have come out. There's no skeletons in wardrobes as of yet. Um, you just become, um, you just admire the guy the more that you learn, basically. And the book, of course, uh, Millican Dalton, A Search for Romance and Freedom. Is that what it's all about? Is that what it was looking for? Yes, one of the newspaper clips that I have, it, it says um, I was... I was basically tired of my life in the um, in the city of London, so I gave up my job to seek romance and freedom, uh, which I think that he definitely did find because for 50 years he upheld his alternative lifestyle without wearying. He never reverted back to normal society. He kind of adapted quite well as well, didn't he? Because I was reading something earlier on. To stay fit uh, during winter, this man used to climb up and down trees so that during the summer, I take it, when his trade was around, it was still fit enough to go up and down the mountains. Yes, um, it was a, a, a hobby of ease. Um, he'd do it in the Chilterns, where he used to live in Buckinghamshire, and also uh, within the depths of Epping Forest. Uh, whether he was climbing trees or rock, he was, you know, he was just keeping his hand in. You were saying about the, the cave where he, where he lived, that you'd seen evidence in the cave that he'd been around. What sort of evidence are we talking? Uh, well, basically we're talking about inscriptions carved into the side of the cave with his initials underneath it. Um, it's basically um, what he's remembered for, it's a little motto, don't waste words, jump to conclusions. That's outside, outside the attic cave, which is the higher section, and to the lower section there's another inscription which says, good comrade, 19, uh, MD 1935. So um, there are, there's, there's evidence still around the cave, even after 56 years. It sounds like a man that had no hidden corners in that he was, he was quite straight talking. He spoke his mind, he, he wasn't trying to impress anybody or uh, create any false impressions. He was um, straight down the middle. I just wonder if he was around today, whether you and he would get on quite well. I would definitely like to spend, have a one-on-one -on -one with the guy and uh, spend a couple of nights in the cave with him, um, enjoying his delightful conversation. Apparently he always had um, a topic to hand, uh, he was a great talker, enjoyed telling ghost stories um, and uh, politics, that was another big big subject which stirred strong emotions. Of course he was a, a pacifist and the discussions in his cave about the Second World War apparently got pretty heated mm -hmm. according to some of the um, anecdotes that I've received. Well, is it true that he used to write to London to tell them to stop the war during the Second World War? Um, according to his nephew, Nick Dalton, um, that's true, yes. Wrote several letters after a visit um, to the cave from the uh, uh, Air Raid Warden for Keswick, uh, who told him not to show a light, so Millican was infuriated by this. He wrote several letters to Winston Churchill in Downing Street, saying, you're interfering with my <laughs> liberty. <laughs> Are many of his family still around then, does he have? Are there many of the Daltons still living? You mentioned his nephew there. Yeah, his um, nephew passed away last year, um, but he, he has, he's got other distant relatives in the Essex area and some in the Devon region. It took you four years to put this book together. And since then, you were telling me just a minute or two ago that more and more information coming your way about Mr Dalton. Uh, does this mean that a second book could be in the offing? At this present time, I've no fixed plans for a second book, but like I say, as, as this information comes um, fruitful, I'm, I'm intending on writing a follow-up um, in some form or another.